it is Thursday, February 9th, 2023, and I'd like to call the Minnesota State and Local Government and Veterans Committee to order. A quorum is present. Welcome. Uh, members, today we're going to take up a series of bills. We have five bills before us. Uh, some we're going to lay over for possible inclusion. Some we're going to move on their way. Uh, and... Uh, uh, we're dealing largely with issues related to veterans, though not exclusively today. Uh, and uh, up first uh, is a bill uh, with Senator Kupik as the author. So Senator Kupik, uh, welcome uh, to the committee. I'd like to move Senate File 303 before the committee and please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Senator Murphy, Chair Murphy. Uh, so I'm Senator Rob Kupek. I am here with the uh, Public Employees Relation Board. I do have uh, an author's amendment, the A3 amendment, uh, that I'd also like to move. Um, we're, we're dealing with some of the public uh, relations. Some of the data is sensitive, and so we've been uh, working on kind of changing the data practices to make as much of the data as we can public while still having the ability for the board to meet Basically, if you're you know, familiar with either a school board or city council, the equivalent of an executive session so that they could meet to discuss you know, private personnel matters behind there. So that's what the, the amendment does. Uh, it just cleans up some of that language, and so I'd just like to put that in today. Senator Kupik moves the A3 amendment. Members, are there questions for Senator Kupik? Seeing no questions, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And those opposed? And that motion is adopted. The bill before us in the order the author likes. Would you like to present the bill? Yes. And I see you have a, a witness uh, to join you. I do. Uh, so the Public Employees Relation Board was set up in uh, 2014. Uh, and it was a way to resolve labor disputes from the public sector more quickly uh, in a way that would cost less than going to court. So it is a, a money-saving bill. The original budget was for $125,000. Uh, the bill was originally authored by Senator Pappas, and when I've talked to her, her idea of that $125,000 was that was the setup fee to kind of get it going, and then it would be funded at some higher rate and then it has never been funded uh, at all above that $125,000. So for much of the existence of the Public Employees Relation Board, or PERB, it has not been able to function because it just has not had uh, any money. It briefly did run for about a year when it had basically saved up enough money that they could run it. And uh, during that year, it heard 31 cases, uh, issued 10 complaints, three went to hearings, and seven of them were settled. And then the remainder were withdrawn or sent to arbitration. So it is a way to for saving money not only for local governments but for public sector employees if they don't have to go to court uh, saves on those court fees. So the PERB functions similar really to the National Labor Relations Act and again it does save money and I, I did a quick back of the I don't know Google search calculation uh, that a labor lawyer is about $331 an hour. Don't tell my parents that uh, <laughs> considering my career that I went into and no offense to any lawyers here. So, sorry about that. Uh, but we'll again, it, is, it, it, can be, it can be a savings for both the community, the state, the county government, as well as the employees. Uh, I have Meg Luger here with me. She's from the Labor Department. She can talk a little bit more about it. Uh, welcome to the committee, Ms. Luger uh, from the District, the Mighty 64. Uh, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Meg Luger-Nikolai, and by day, I'm an attorney with Education Minnesota, so having thrown my life away, I think, <laughs> as some folks might view it, and then by night, and actually our meetings are typically in the morning, I am the labor representative and currently the chair of the Public Employment um, Relations Board. And Senator Cooper gave us a great little introduction, so I'm going to do my best not to, to trod on, on well-trod ground already, but the, the, just to give folks a sense of what the PERB does, um, folks may know that public sector employees in the state of Minnesota are governed by the Public Employment Relations, uh, Labor Relations Act. And PELRA is chiefly important for a lot of us because it gives us the, the rules for how we organize collective bargaining relationships and, and our agreements. However, when there are disputes, um, those go right to court. And that is different from the system that is in the private sector in which there's an administrative body with a deep uh, expertise 
expertise in the labor relations milieu. And so, you know, our, we, our, we work heavily with the Bureau of Mediation Services, whose chief work is mediating disputes before they come to a head, as well as helping um, folks organize their bargaining units. But when there is what is called an unfair labor practice, or a ULP, um, those are disputes that, without the PERB, will go to court and will entail significant litigation costs and take months and, and even years to actually resolve. So the view when PERB was adopted in 2014 was that this would be a much faster way of resolving disputes. It would be a much less expensive way of, of resolving disputes because ideally it could be done without lawyers. I don't really support that personally, but I understand that other people do. And it can be, and it can be done without lawyers and it can be done quickly by people who have ex lots of experience in, um, in resolving labor disputes. The, structure of our board is that it is three people. There is a union representative, that's me. There is a representative from management, that's my colleague from Hennepin County, and then a neutral that the parties select. And then we each have alternates backing us up. And as Senator Kupik said, we started <laughs> with a $125,000 budget, which we hoped would expand to an operational amount later, and it never did. And so when the board actually came online and began operating in 2020, we kind of white-knuckled it through that period because we were really concerned about where that, that budget would go. So part of the reason that we were actually able to make it was that we couldn't afford to hire any staff. The budget that we had didn't enable us to hire a full-time personnel of any type. Um, and so th the request that we have today before this committee and that we hope that we'll have your support on is for a $750,000 budget, which is a tiny budget in terms of overall state government, but will actually enable us to hire people. So we've had a part-time retiree who's been our executive director. She is amazing, but she's been our chief cook and bottle walk watcher, and we can only hire her at a point three. So we'd like to be able to hire a full-time executive director a full-time investigator and full-time admin staff. We would still obviously be on the, the tiny side, again, of Minnesota government, and we are happy to, to run as lean as possible, but we, we have to actually be able to pay people. MMB is very clear about that. Um, MMB has helped us understand what those costs are likely to be. They can't band a position for us until we actually have an appropriation. <laughs> and so we've done our best to, to model potential costs on other agencies. So we believe that the cost of an executive director is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of between $100,000 and $120,000. We believe that the cost of an, an investigator is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of about $90,000. And then admin support costs have been estimated at approximately $54,000. In addition to that, we rent space from the Bureau of Mediation Services. That cost has been $22,000 per year, and we, there, you know, whether or not we remain in the same location may affect those costs, so we're trying to look ahead to that. And additionally, the, the service and support that we get from Minute costs us approximately $22,000, um, and the... And then additionally, we have the cost of hearing officers. So when we receive a charge, we determine whether or not, the, or actually the, our staff determines whether or not the, the charge has merit, which is to say, is there a reasonable basis in fact or law? If there is, then it is sent to a hearing officer. And we also have to pay the, those individuals who bring their expertise to the work. So this is what the, the budget will entail for us. Um, we, again, this is a steal at twice the price from my perspective because we keep folks out of court. We try to resolve, as, as Senator Kupik's summary noted, a lot of those cases we were able to resolve without sending them actually to a hearing process because we were able to assess the merits and determine whether or not it was something that um, actually had legs. And if it didn't, the case ended. And that took far, you know, that took a matter of weeks as opposed to months, which was what would have happened in court. So we are grateful for Senator Kupik's support, grateful for the committee's time, and, and hope that we can have your support going forward. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Luger Nikolai. And for members, uh, when we move on this, it will move next to the Committee on Judiciary. It started in labor, and I expect um, the appropriation for this will come from that committee. Um, members, are there questions for Senator Kupik? Senator Anderson. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, I'm, prior to the amendment coming on, uh, Senator Kubek, you said there was no cost to this bill, and then we have the amendment coming on, and I'm wondering, is there a cost to the amendment that's being put forward here? And another question, 
Uh, it says on page one, delete subdivision two. And I'm looking on page one of this bill and I can't find subdivision. I see a section two, but I don't see a subdivision two. But maybe you can answer the first question first. Sure. Uh, in terms in terms of the the cost of the amendment, there I don't think there is a cost to the amendment. It's just it's just kind of laying out the data practices or at least the privacy issues and the data practices. So it's just kind of making sure the ground rules are set as to what can be discussed in public and what cannot be discussed in public. And then as for the the does the uh, Page one, subdivision two. Senator, Ku Senator Kupik? Yes. Um, council Sorry, is Chief. Council is prepared to just okay. so the committee's clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, council White. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, subdivision two starts on page one, line 20, and goes through page two, line 22. So that subdivision is being deleted in the amendment and replaced by the new language in the A3. Madam Chair, I don't have a line 20. Senator Anderson. What I am looking at right now is in our packet, there is a copy of Senate File 303, um, but it has not been duplicated to include all of the lines. So I think what we need to do uh, is from our pages uh, get Senator Kupik. Are you in a rush? No. <laughs> Senator Kupik, what I'd like to do, if it's all right with you, um, since we need to get copies of the, the bill um, in its entirety in front of us, is give the pages a moment to do that work. And with your approval, with Senate File 303 amended as it is, I'd like to lay that on the table, uh, call up our next bill, and when we have that copy in front of us, then I'd like you to come back and we'll finish up. Sure, Chair Murphy, that'd be great. Can Thank you very much. Keep your business moving along. Uh, members, I'd like to lay Senate File 303 as amended on the table momentarily. Thank you, Senator Anderson, uh, for recognizing that, and uh, we'll get it together, and we'll have it in front of us in the way that, uh, so we can act on it. Seems simple. I think you're right. Not. Uh, Members, uh, as we move on, I'd like to uh, welcome Senator Klein to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. Uh, this is a committee where we work every day to serve the people of Minnesota, improve their lives, and do that with integrity. Um, it is important uh, for me. And Senator Klein, uh, welcome to the committee. I would like to move uh, Senate File 1039. Uh, please introduce yourself and please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. I'm Matt Klein, State Senator from District 53, and thank you for hearing the Senate File 1039. I will present the bill, but I uh, have an author's amendment, the A1, which I was hoping your committee could move. Members, Senator Klein has, uh, has the A1 amendment, which I am just making sure is in our packet. Here it is. So I would move uh, the A1 amendment, and it is before us. Senator Klein. Madam Chair, members, Senate File 1039 came to me from a constituent family, the, uh, the Orange family, and their nephew, uh, who I believe is available to testify today, has a letter in your packet, Sergeant Matthew Ritchie, who served uh, with distinction in Iraq as part of Operation Inherent Resolve, but uh, through what I believe was an oversight, uh, was not eligible thereafter uh, for the Veterans Bonus Program. Uh, just a little history uh, on the Veterans Bonus Program. It was established uh, in 1997, and then we updated it last year in 2022 to reflect the current dates of active duty service. Last year in 2022, $24.88 million was appropriated for service bonuses. It was a one-time appropriation. The A1 amendment, which you've just put before your committee, would appropriate an additional $22 million uh, to include the, the veterans who were previously omitted. Uh, and uh, with that brief presentation of the bill, Madam Chair, I have testifiers. Uh, thank you, Senator Klein. And before we go to the testifier, uh, I would like to move uh, the A1 amendment. Other questions? Senator Lang? So moved. Senator Lang moves the A1 amendment. Are there, seeing no further questions, all those in favor? Say aye. Aye. And those opposed? And the amendment is adopted. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself uh, and proceed. 
Uh, Chair Murphy, members of the committee, my name is Benjamin Johnson. I'm the Legislative Director for the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of this bill. Uh, beginning in July of 2022, MDVA began processing applications. Uh, after reviewing nearly 22,000, we've identified two areas for improvement, opportunities to admit many Minnesota veterans currently ineligible for any bonus, and an award to increase the bonus amount for veterans who would otherwise be only eligible for a lesser amount. Veterans who currently live in Minnesota but did not begin their service here are not eligible to apply for the post-9-11 veteran service bonus. Most other Minnesota-specific veteran benefits allow for veterans who entered military service in other states to access programs and services after becoming a Minnesota resident. In addition, otherwise eligible Minnesota veterans who received the Inherent Resolve Campaign Medal but not one of the existing qualifying medals are only eligible for the $600 bonus. That's the lowest tier of bonus. Before the creation of the Inherent Resolve Campaign Medal, a service member deployed for service in Iraq, Syria, or the contiguous waters or airspace would likely have been eligible for only the Global War on Terrorism Expeditionary Medal, and that level of uh, service would have allowed someone to receive a $1,200 bonus. Uh, the Governor recommends adding the Inherent Resolve Campaign Medal as a qualifying award and amending the eligibility requirements to allow current Minnesota resident veterans who entered military service in another state but subsequently moved to Minnesota after their service to access Minnesota's post-9-11 veteran service bonus. He also supports the inclusion of $22 million in additional funding in fiscal year 24 to ensure that all of these additional members are included and uh, are able to receive their bonuses. I also wanted to report to the committee uh, that as of yesterday, uh, we have, as, as a state agency, received, again, nearly 22,000 applications. We have processed 21,959. A total of 18,432 have been approved, and we have, uh, we have mailed checks, or the state of Minnesota has mailed checks in the amount of $19.71 million. Uh, applications, as they, are, as they come in, uh, are, are processed immediately. So between July of last year and yesterday, uh, we have seen a significant amount of interest in this program, and we are excited about the opportunity to continue to move forward in support of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jensen, for your testimony. Are there questions? Uh, Senator Lang. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, Mr. Johnson, Senator Klein, good afternoon. Uh, so my first big problem with this bill is my it's the same bill that I have, and my name isn't on the top of the sheet. So. Uh, I guess a big question, you know, last year as we have gone through this, uh, this long process, it was jammed in about a two-month session uh, uh, prior to getting that veterans omnibus bill passed last year. So this was, I don't know, maybe a little fortuitous as the bill passed. Um, but I, I guess the, the, the big question here is are we missing anybody at this point in time? And what I would say to the committee is as this process went on, uh, the questions of both the department and uh, some of the folks that lived within the department was, where do we draw the line, right? Uh, who are Minnesota veterans? Are they those active duty soldiers that live in Minnesota or are from Minnesota and never actually served in the Minnesota uh, military? Or is it even, you know, those Minis Wisconsin residents that served within my unit, you know, where, where do we draw the line? How do we do this? Uh, and I, I think we, we came to a good point on that. The problem was, well, twofold, we didn't put enough money in the bill, which I'll, I'll say that I'm right about. Uh, we should have put more money in the bill. Um, so the question, I guess, is what is the percentage of uh, veterans that uh, are eligible have actually applied? Is this enough money? And are we covering everybody is the big three questions that I'm going to ask. And hopefully, you know, I thought we were doing due diligence last year, but uh, uh, here we are. <laughs> Senator Klein, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Chair Murphy, uh, Senator Lang, I'll do my best to answer those. Um, we believe, again, there is no by name list of veterans in the state of Minnesota. So our, our best guess is that, that we have currently reached somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 50 percent. Um, I see you writing it down. That concerns me. Uh, uh, we, believe, we believe that we are, we are reaching uh, most of the veterans who would have received either the, uh, would have received one of the currently uh, eligible um, medals or um, for service, 
or uh, could have been eligible otherwise. Uh, we don't know how many are at the lower service level who maybe didn't deploy and aren't aware that they're eligible. There's a certain percentage of veterans who served post 9-11 in, in the two decades following 9-11 that may think this is not for me. I didn't deploy, I wasn't overseas, I, I wouldn't be eligible at all. So the goal, the commissioner's goal in this case is to reach 85% of the veterans that we have, uh, we have developed a, 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 a the parameters that would meet that eligibility. Again, uh, it's, ch it's challenging to know uh, for certain, but um, the goal is 85% of any and all eligible veterans, which would significantly outpace past service bonuses. Um, we think in this day and age, the ability to reach those is, uh, is greater, and that's his, that's his goal. Um, and yes, we believe that this, the amount requested is in line with that number of veterans. Um, I can provide the committee with additional data to support that as well. Uh, I know we're tracking that in our employment and, and uh, education uh, division. Thanks, Director Johnson. And if you, if you share that with our office, we'll make sure we get it to the entire committee. Senator Lang. Thank you, Senator Lang. Uh, before we go back to the bill's author, we do have one more uh, witness who's here to testify virtually. Uh, that's Matthew Ritchie. Uh, welcome to the committee, Mr. Ritchie. Please join us, introduce yourself, and proceed. Good afternoon, and thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Sergeant Matthew P, and I'm here to discuss what I believe to be an injustice found in the post 11 Veterans Service Bonus. I also wrote Governor Walls on this issue in September of 2022. I served for six years in the Minnesota Army National Guard, and I'm a combat veteran of the Iraq War Operation Inherent Resolve Campaign, otherwise known as OIR. I deployed from October of 2019 to November of 2020, and I was attached to a medevac team where I was part of over 50 missions. These are some of the proudest moments of my life. Conversely, I was in Iraq when tragedy struck. Camp Taji was attacked with over 60 rockets and small arms fire between March 11th and 13th of 2020, killing three troops and wounding over 17 others. We worked many sleepless nights as a result, and we lived off of energy drinks to sustain ourselves for our life-saving missions. We were attacked on dozens of other occasions and served on many more missions, being crucial in preventing further death and destruction that the war brought to our doorstep. OIR has resulted in physical and emotional trauma for many, myself included. I live with these scars of war every day. Our service is no less than any other campaign of the war, and I believe our lack of representation in the bonus just, uh, discredits our service. It is not about money, but rather the recognition of the sacrifices we made in combat. Please add OIR to the post 9 11 veteran service bonus and consider my testimony here as a reflection of my views as well as the views of countless other OIR veterans and our desire to be recognized for the sacrifices and contributions we made for our state and our nation. Thank you for your time, I appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony, Sergeant, and thank you for your service. Thank you for your support. Senator Klein. Thank you, Chair Murphy and committee for hearing the bill, and thank you, Senator, uh, Sergeant Ritchie, for your service. Uh, I would be grateful for a favorable hearing on this bill uh, so that we can do right by our Minnesota veterans. Seeing oh, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Klein, was there a fiscal note uh, requested? Senator Klein. Madam Chair and Senator Anderson, uh, we will request a fiscal note, but a, the, the fiscal note, I can tell you, is contained within the A1 amendment, which would be a 22 that, Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Andrew. Uh, ma Madam Chair and, and Senator Anderson, the, this is the uh, kind of bill that wouldn't require a fiscal note because there's a direct appropriation right in the bill. It's the amount that's that's um, going to go out in a, as a direct appropriation for the purposes specified in the bill. So as Senator Klein has said, it would come back saying, well, it's $22 million, That's what's in the bill. Seeing no further discussion, members, uh, Senator Lang moves that we lay this bill over for possible inclusion in a veterans ominous bill. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. Senator Anderson. We're working on it, Senator Kupek. You'll be next, I believe. Knock on wood. Welcome to the committee, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, uh, thank you for the indulgence of hearing this bill. Uh, members, the bill 
uh, before you <clears throat> is in relationship to a bill that was heard back in 2018. And it was at that time that we passed the bill to help prohibit predatory lending practices perpetrated against our military veterans and service members. Specifically, the bill signed into law prohibited the practice of lending upfront cash to service members and veterans in exchange for the service member or veteran signing away us or assigning rights to their pay or future benefits that they may have gotten. The bill provides for remedies for the victimized service member or veteran to go to court and, and get attorney fees and costs. So really the, the, the way the bill had been written, and I didn't notice it until uh, the gentleman that's sitting next to me uh, made mention of it to me earlier in session, actually before session, that there was kind of a, a mishap that in the way the bill had been written or the way that it went from committee to finally being uh, signed into law. And the bill, as you see, is just changing one word from or to and. And if there's, a, I guess the, the thing that um, legal aid would like to have is just the opportunity to be able to put both sides of the, the language together to provide our service members and veterans the opportunity to get their due benefits if something like this were to happen to them. So, uh, Madam Chair, I would like to have our testifier speak on, his, on behalf of the bill, if that's okay with the committee. Thank you, um, Lead Anderson. Senator Anderson does move Senate File 815 <clears throat> before the committee. Um, welcome to the committee, Mr. Elwood, if you'd like to introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, Ron Elwood with Legal Aid. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Senator Anderson for uh, agreeing to author this bill. And thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Lang for co-authoring the bill. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm perhaps the only person in Minnesota who noticed this. Um, I had the privilege of working with Senator Anderson in 2018 and Representative Bliss on the other side of the House when the, they brought this bill forward. It, in my experience, if you know Legal Aid, we have been um, kind of a consumer advocates for my entire 25 years here in the legislature. And I have to say that the bill that Senator Anderson brought forward in 2018 was perhaps um, one of the most, if not the most important consumer protection provisions that I've ever had the privilege to work on uh, because it was a uh, horrible practices that were being perpetrated against service members and veterans and this bill um, prohibited that. I will say that we have not seen a case where this mistake has cost anybody but I think it's important that we make sure that this doesn't happen, that a veteran who is victimized would have to choose between getting monetary relief or having to um, have a rescission of the contract or some other equitable relief. It should have been both. It was intended to be both at the beginning, and now we're just going to correct a, a, an error. How that ever happened, I don't know. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and it's been a really privilege to work with you, Senator Anderson, on this really important piece of legislation. Members, are there questions for the bill's author? Seeing no further questions, Senator Anderson renews his motion. Yes. Uh, to move Senate File 815 be uh, recommended to pass and move to the, commis the Committee on Judiciary. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. Motion's adopted. Thank you very Madam much, Chair, Senator thank Anderson. You. Thank you for the ones who signed on to the bill also. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Senator Kupek. Welcome back uh, to the committee. I would like to take Senate File 303 as amended from the table. And the pages are handing that out. So we just want to make sure that everybody has it. Again, I want to thank Senator Anderson for catching uh, the, the issue that we had with the bill in front of us. We now have the proper document in front of us. 
And perhaps we go back to Council White, um, when you're ready, Council White, to talk to us again about, um, or to respond to Senator Anderson's question about where the amendment was in the bill. Madam Chair and members, the A3 amendment replaces subdivision two, which starts on line, on page one, line 20, and goes through page two, line 22. Thank you. Are there further questions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, well, as the testifier on behalf of the bill mentioned that there was amounts of money that were going to be distributed, and so uh, when Senator Kubek said that this amendment isn't going to cost money, and yet the testifier seemed to give indication that because of this amendment, and maybe I'm misreading that, but because of the amendment that was put on, there was going to be some uh, costs for individuals within the department. Or, and am I, maybe I'm mistaken about that, but uh, I'm just trying to get some clarification. Ms. Luger Nikolai. Madam Chair and Senator Anderson, I appreciate that question. You know, when I was discussing the, uh, the possible allocations, those were related to staff costs for the agency as a whole. The amendment doesn't affect those appropriations. We're going to expect that the people that we hire are responsible for those data classifications as well as the board itself. So the, the, um, the amendment is really limited to how we are characterizing the data and shouldn't have itself an additional financial cost. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Anderson. Are there further questions for Senator Kupek? All right, members, seeing no further questions, uh, I move uh, that we recommend Senate File 303 as amended to pass and be re referred to the Committee on Judiciary. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. And those opposed, say no. You're on your way. Great. Thank, thank you. you, Senator Kupek, for your patience. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Anderson, as well. And thank you for our staff who uh, remedied this situation with all due haste. I appreciate that. All right. Next, Senator Mitchell. Welcome to the committee, Senator Mitchell. Please introduce yourself. Um, you can move your bill uh, and we can proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is an appropriation for Meals on Wheels, but to expand the program from currently it does serve some veterans if they already um, are eligible for the program, to reaching out to additional veterans who might not traditionally be eligible for the program, um, but might still be in need of this service. Um, what drew me to being the author, chief author for this was, as far as we can tell, this would be the first time ever in the country that there would be a program like this. It would be a test program. And um, the thought behind it is also attempting to recruit veterans to do the contacts. So the reason that that's valuable is, especially for that community, just having that additional human contact is a good check-in point for the veterans for things like helping prevent the suicide rate, loneliness, um, possibly having it be another veteran so that it's someone that they can, they can talk to about their, their shared experiences or maybe even direct them to, to other resources. Um, Meals on Wheels itself has you know, great outreach with if there's that contact, the people involved are more likely to be taking their medicine on a regular basis, having a nutritional meal on a regular basis. So there's already those things and we want to be able to expand that to more veterans. Um, I have Mr. Colleen with me today who can can explain a little more if that would be allowed. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Let's just get um, the documents sure. before us in order. Right. So Senator Mitchell moves Senate file 774 to be before the committee. And I understand, Senator Mitchell, that you have an amendment. Yes, I would like to move the A1 amendment. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't change the amounts. It, it just cleans it up a little bit. So basically, it's, it's easier to read, so to speak. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Senator Mitchell moves the A1 amendment. Mr. Erickson, do you have anything to add? 
Madam Chair, no, I think uh, Senator Mitchell did a good job describing it. Essentially, the, the bill is drafted, um, sets a base for fiscal year 2025 and a, a $0 base for fiscal 26, but we are already in the 24-25 biennium, so it would be permitted to just make that appropriation. So this, this makes the appropriation for both years and makes that a one-time appropriation. All right. Are there questions? Senator Lang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Mitchell, I guess that I got a little history with, with this bill. And in the past, a couple things, a, a kudos to you, I, I think, more than anything, is when we come to uh, last year when this was offered, Senator Franz and had this uh, bill, and there was a little bit of consternation when it came to the bill. And I, I'm very protective of the word veteran, and, and honestly, the veteran dollars that goes along with that. Um, so I, I, I would say that uh, on line 1.11, that, that paragraph that's added in there, I, I appreciate that paragraph. It gives me a little bit of comfort language when it comes to this bill. Um, so realistically, uh, the two questions that I would have is, I'm going to ask it even though I think it's answered in this paragraph, is then can a non-veteran uh, apply for and, and get a, a veteran meals on wheels is, tech, is the first question. And then I'll ask the second one too. This is general fund dollars, but does that come from the veterans on this bill? Uh, bottom line really is the two questions I would ask. Um, Senator Mitchell and Senator so Lang, this can, when, yes, when can, we um, when we dispense with this, when we move this, we'll lay it over for possible inclusion. Senator Mitchell, um, yes, Madam Chair, do you want me to talk more about the bill now or the um, the amendment? How about if we take a vote on the amendment and then we can proceed to discussion? So, uh, all those in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. Aye. And those opposed, and the amendment is adopted. The bill before us, Senator Mitchell. Yes, um, thank you. And now if I can address Senator Lang's question. Um, yes, it is veterans. And um, to speak a little bit more to that, which is I was waiting to move the amendment first. Um, now may I have Mr. Colling um, add his testimony? Welcome to the committee, Mr. Colling. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Dave Colling. I am the Community Partnerships and Contract Manager with Metro Meals on Wheels. Um, our Executive Director, Pat Rowan, was not able to be here today, but um, he, he, he also would normally be here for, for this, but um, I'm lucky enough to fill in. So uh, a little bit of background on uh, Metro Meals on Wheels. We have 30 programs around the metro area, and we've served over one and a half million people, uh, seniors and people living with disabilities last year. Um, what we do is at Metro Meals on Wheels with our programs is we provide the referrals, the enrollments, the financial support, outreach, volunteer recruitment, technical support, and we also manage a central kitchen um, that produces most of our meals. We also have a specialized kitchens for uh, halal meals, for um, kosher meals, and for meals serving South Asian community. Um, so, but our local partners deal directly with volunteers and the recipients in their communities. So it is locally driven and locally run. Uh, to, uh, to this, in, in the past, we have had our local programs reach out to us about veterans, and, but did not, they did not qualify for other programs. Either they were not uh, dis, uh, receiving um, uh, disability payments through a waiver, um, or they were not seniors. They, was, they did not qualify for other programs like the um, Older Americans Act funding. So we've been, been talking about this for quite a while locally, and nationally, Meals on Wheels America has been working with the, uh, the Veterans Affairs Committee to try to find something we could, um, a way we could serve more veterans that did not qualify for other services uh, through our program. And again, it's that those daily visits are as, as important as those meals. And all our studies that we've done in the past locally and nationally have shown that folks that get those visits are more likely, as the Senator said, to take medications, to see a doctor. They're more likely to uh, stay in their homes longer in, in the cases of seniors, but also just have more stable housing, uh, more stable lives with that daily visit. And with, with this program, if we once, uh, hopefully, if it goes through, knock on wood, we can uh, have our, the plan is to have veterans helping veterans, serving veterans those meals, and we would like to work closely with the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs as we can to f find those veterans and to find the most at-risk veterans that we could serve for this meal. And um, 
uh, one thing I'll also say, it is Metro Meals on Wheels. We would love to be able to take this statewide at some point. Um, and there are other programs statewide that we partner with and other programs that we could do that um, if this were to work out. Um, most likely Lutheran Social Services serves much of the state outside of the metro area. And it would be a, an easy move for us to do that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So, so, Madam Chair, I, I just wanted to add in that t context before I started answering questions. Um, again, th this, as far as we know, would be the first time in the country. It would be a test program because we already have the infrastructure with Metro Meals on Wheels. But if it goes well, which we hope it does, then we have um, the capacity, it's a two-year test program, to move it throughout the state and expand that. Um, so, and I hope within that, the fact that this would specifically serve veterans that aren't already eligible to the program also asks answers Senator Lang's question. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Are there further questions? Seeing no further questions, then Senator Mitchell uh, moves that Senate File 774, as amended, be recommended to pass, and we will lay it on the t lay it over for possible inclusion in a veterans omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Senator Hauschild. Welcome to the committee, Senator House Child. Uh, Senator Gustafson moves Senate File 351 uh, be before the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself uh, and proceed. I know you've got testifiers, so let's move through bill presentation, your testifiers, and we'll go to questions. Thank you, Chair Murphy, committee members. I'm honored to be in front of you presenting Senate File 351, a grant program for veterans on the lake in Ely. Joining me today is Veterans on the Lake Board Chair Eric uh, May ran in, Veterans on the Lake General Manager Andy Birkenpass, and with me in person is Nathan Burr, board member for Veterans on the Lake. Madam Chair, Veterans on the Lake is a nonprofit, one of a kind wilderness resort located in my legislative district, just outside of Ely in the Superior National Forest and across Fall Lake from the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Their mission is to reduce barriers and provide safe access to recreational experiences for disabled veterans and other disabled persons. In 2021, the legislator appropriated $50,000 to create a grant program aiding disabled veterans from around Minnesota to have a wilderness experience at Veterans on the Lake. The program has been a big success. And here to tell you more uh, are my testifiers, and perhaps we can start with uh, Mr. Burr. Thank you, Senator Housechild. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Burr. Uh, please introduce yourself and proceed. My name is Nathan Burr, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, distinguished committee members, it is a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, thank you for your continued support to all veterans, veterans organizations, and of course, Veterans on the Lake Resort. A uh, specific thank you to Senator Hoschild uh, for introducing Senate File 351, which funds a grant program helping to connect disabled and abled veterans with Veterans on the Lake Resort in Ely. Uh, thank you to this committee for the hearing today. Again, I am Nathan Burr, a 21 plus year member of the Minnesota National Guard and still actively serving. I have three combat tours, many overseas training events and stay active duty missions throughout my career. I'm a board member at Veterans on the Lake Resort and have been for just over a year. As an avid outdoorsman and someone that takes advantage of the Great Boundary Waters canoe area, Veteran on the Lake has great importance to not only myself, my family, but my fellow veterans and their families. Our mission at Veterans on the Lake is to reduce barriers and provide safe access to recreational experiences for veterans, the disabled, and the general public. We are a not-for-profit resort focusing on providing veterans, the disabled, and the public opportunities for inclusion in outdoor recreational activities and mental respite. Our recreational resort is designed to honor those who have contributed to and sacrificed for our nation, to help them heal from the pain and suffering they endured. We strive to make the veterans on the lake resort facilities and outdoor amenities safely accessible and barrier free. We were founded in 1982. Since then, we have hosted veterans and their guests from 34 different states. Most of our guests come here from Minnesota 
and include groups from the Minnesota State Veterans Homes in Silver Bay, Minneapolis, Hastings, Fergus Falls, the VA Medical Center in St. Cloud, and the Duluth Vets Clinics. We are truly a statewide institution as veterans from around Minnesota come to our facility for rest and relaxation throughout the year. Our resort is unique because it caters to disabled veterans and others with physical and mental disabilities. As a nonprofit facility, this recreation location was designed to and currently serves the needs of disabled veterans, able-bodied veterans, active duty military, their family, and friends. The resort setting is unique and it sits inside the Superior National Forest and is adjacent to the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, providing disabled veterans with wilderness experiences. 81% of the people using our facilities are disabled veterans, their families, and support teams. We also have many groups that use the facility, including the Fergus Falls Silver Bay Veterans Home, like I said before. Our facilities are unique. Uh, we have cabins and trails that are fully accessible to wheelchairs. We have a heated pool with a Hoyer lift. We have a wood-fired sauna. We have pontoon boats and other boats equipped for people with disabilities. We are the only organization allowed to utilize a pontoon within the Boundary Waters. You do not find these accommodations at other facilities. Uh, we are here to connect those with disabilities and mobile, mobility issues with the wilderness. To help support disabled veterans who need this wilderness experience, uh, the legislature in 2021 created this unique grant program that helps to connect disabled veterans with the wilderness experience. This appropriation we are discussing today will help us continue to provide opportunities for more disabled and able-bodied American veterans to have a therapeutic wilderness experience in northern Minnesota. The healing power of the wilderness and environment that surrounds and encompasses veterans on the lake is impactful and noticeable. I am one of many that have found respite and healing at Veterans on the Lake. During my time as a commander, I lost six men due to unexpected death, suicide, and tragic training accident. Needless to say, this difficult and tragic time was not easy for myself or my family. Veteran on the Lake provided the focus family time and space needed to help the healing process. Mentally, physically, emotionally, and relationship-based growth is allowed to thrive with, with, with in what Veterans on the Lake has to offer. I was able to participate last year in one of the retreats this funding supported uh, with some of my fellow veterans. That time on the ice is one that I'll cherish with my fellow brothers in arms for the rest of my life. I was also able to visit with multiple veterans on many of these retreats and saw firsthand the benefit each retreat had. In today's world of veterans, generational gaps sometimes act as a barrier to connection and relationship building. I have seen this barrier disappear at Veterans on the Lake. I have seen shared experiences, although completely different circumstances, allow individuals to build immediate trust and heal together. The bonds and friendships built during these opportunities are beyond ex explanation. Senate File 351 matters and helps veterans from all eras connect, share, heal, and grow. Veterans on the Lake sets the conditions and environment for this to occur, and this funding allows for the most comprehensive approach for this desired outcome. Uh, we are here today to thank all of you for considering Senator Hochschild's legislation to continue this incredible grant program created by the legislature in 2021. Uh, for that, I want to thank you. Madam Chair, Senator, and board, uh, our board chair, Eric, and General Manager Andy are on uh, Zoom and are willing to, are able to speak to the numbers of success of this grant program. Thank you, Mr. Burr. Um, thank you for your service and your leadership and for your testimony today. Uh, we would be grateful to hear from the further witnesses, Eric, and I'm, I'm gonna say your name wrong, so please introduce yourself uh, and forgive me for that. Um, welcome to the committee. I believe you're on mute. Try that. Welcome to the committee, sir. Okay. It's okay, Madam Chair. It's been mispronounced before. <laughs> well, welcome to the committee. Uh, Please introduce yourself and proceed. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee, honorable members of the committee, I'm Eric Marinin. I'm currently the chairman of the board of Veterans on the Lake Resort. 
uh, up here in northern Minnesota. <clears throat> I'm a veteran myself, 69 to 72 regular army, boots on the ground in Germany and Vietnam. I'm here today to, to thank Senator Huschild for sponsoring Senate File 351. Uh, I witnessed what happened. The last scholarship opportunity we had with the veterans that did come and participate, uh, as my colleague, Mr. Burr said, uh, it was my observation of those groups, the barriers were gone. There were multiple generations of veterans who sat in a fish house and soon became good friends. Playing cards till two in the morning by the end of the third day, it was pretty incredible, pretty moving. Uh, veterans on the Lake Resort was started in 1982. We were working partnership with the U.S. Forest Service. Last year, we served 8,386 guests. <clears throat> of those, 6,712 uh, were veterans. And of those, these are the Forest Service's reporting numbers now, uh, 3,964 were disabled veterans. Now, those aren't just disabled people, I'm not gonna mislead you. Those are disabled and their staff, their family, and the healthcare workers, whoever comes with them. The way the Forest Service counts it, it's part of the disabled number. We also served 1,748 veterans who were 65 and older, our aging population. We had 635 able-bodied veterans show up at the resort, and we had 365 active duty members that showed up at the resort that we hosted. And we also had 164 disabled public. A lot of that disabled public is a retreat that the Minnesota Wild Hockey Team has for the Spinal Bifia Hockey Team. They're their sponsors and we also cater to them. As we were, you were told before, we, we do have another, we have many ways that we try and take down the barriers for the disabled. I think one of the most unique ones is our pontoon boat <laughs> here at the resort. We've eliminated the seats. If you're in a wheelchair, we pick you up, put your chair on the boat and put you in the chair on the boat. There's no seats in the boat, no barriers. You go right up to the edge and you fish. Uh, the sauna, the Hoyer lift at the pool. We've got a fishing dock, ramp accessible. I've got feedback from our guests that they're like little kids when they show up at the resort. A little kid going to summer camp. And this bill in 2021, it was passed in 2021, scholarship 68 veterans. It helped scholarship 58 veterans. The original number would have supported 57 veterans. But what we did was we took money that had been donated in a special fund for scholarships and we took some of our administrative costs and we funded a scholarship for 68 veterans. I hope this bill passes. I see it as very beneficial to the veteran community. Uh, I, I saw multiple generations of veterans becoming comrades here at the resort. And at this time, I'll turn it over to the general manager. If there are no questions, any questions, Madam Chair? Thank you for your testimony, uh, for your service and for your leadership. And we can move on to Mr. Birkenpass. And uh, if there are questions, we can take them at the end. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee.
Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andy Birkenpass. I am the general manager of Veterans on the Lake Resort. Uh, I am a civilian, very important to know, but I have served the veteran community throughout the United States of America for the last 24 years before my employment at Veterans on the Lake Resort. Uh, <clears throat> I've seen what uh, the scholarship program did for our veterans last year, and I, I consider myself to be the tip of the spear, per se, to designate the funds the proper way. Uh, by the proper way, I mean what can a veteran achieve the most of through the scholarship program, and that is uh, interaction with fellow veterans, which has been my experience throughout serving veterans uh, throughout my career. Uh, by that, I mean bringing veterans from all over the state of Minnesota to gather in different groups. Uh, and it really worked well. Uh, we'd have people that, uh, as Eric had said, uh, didn't know one another when they came here. And that first night, uh, we served a nice meal and a meet and greet scenario situation. And it's kind of like... Uh, your first prom you go to and you're nervous to ask that person to dance with you. And then at the end of the retreat, everybody is shaking hands and exchanging phone numbers. It's a very comfortable situation. And that's the networking that we try to uh, provoke throughout these retreats, as well as uh, a good, stable environment, a learning environment uh, about resources and about abilities. It's been my experience to take uh, the dis out of disability, and let's see what your abilities are. And uh, very, very proud to be here, very proud to be uh, serving our veteran community in the state of Minnesota as I served in the state of Iowa for several years. So, uh, as Eric said, we served uh, a total of 68 veterans, uh, and we, we actually sponsored uh, 27 of those veterans who did not meet the criteria of uh, definition of a veteran to the state of Minnesota, which means combat active or boots on the ground, per se. Uh, some service members that were, uh, two in particular, one had 28 years of service in the National Guard, and the other had 31 years of service in the National Guard, but never saw active duty combat. Uh, we also had uh, women's veterans uh, groups come up, 13 to be exact, and they had their own two separate retreats. It was actually very good for them as well, uh, learning experiences. So we're not just about funding an ice fishing trip or a fishing scholarship. We're about networking and helping our veterans learn about the veteran community they live and work in and how to get over some of those hurdles that veterans do face. Thank you very much for your testimony, uh, Mr. <clears throat> Birkenpass, um, and for your work supporting veterans. Members, are there questions or comments that you'd like to make before Senator Lang? You know I'm gonna say something, right, Madam Chair? <laughs> so uh, I guess a couple things. One, it's just shocking that you don't have uh, Representative Detmer here, I'm sure you have him chained up in a room someplace trying to stop him from uh, arguing for Veterans on the Lake because he's been such an advocate over the years. But um, I guess the, could you just talk a little bit about the history of some of the funding? Because this is, I think, probably the third or fourth time we've probably heard a bill similar to this. And, and maybe um, funding levels or something, and I, I probably will get uh, shellacked in the back room for suggesting such a thing that this is put into the base, but... Uh, it's maybe a topic of discussion that uh, maybe not for today, but another day possibly. Um, if you could just talk about that. Senator Housechild. Thank you, Chair Murphy. Um, Senator Lang, thank you for the question. I may rely on counsel uh, if they do have further background. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was my understanding that this was started um, in 2021 with a $50,000 allocation. Mr. Erickson. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator House Child and Senator Lang. Yes, there's a $50,000 one-time appropriation made in the bill in, in uh, 2021. And to my knowledge, that was the, the first time that funding has come across. Senator Lang? Hmm. I'll have to look. I think we did uh, something last year in the omnibus too, did we not? Well, I can check that out, Senator okay. Lang. Doesn't matter. Here we are. Mm -hmm. uh, support the idea, support the, uh, especially the ice fishing. Uh, let me know if you need some help with that. So. Thank you, Senator. Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. Mr. Burke. The, the, the grant proposal that you're discussing about, and you've seen it uh, more than once across your desk, in fact, there is only one $50,000 grant that came to Veterans on the Lake Resort. However, that grant was extended due to COVID-19 restrictions placed upon uh, social gatherings. So the grant from 2021 actually pushed into 22. 20, uh, 2020 actually pushed into 2021 and 2022. Matt, Madam Chair, I think, I'll say, I think I'll save Mr. Erickson the work. It just dawned on me that was a uh, uh, wastewater project that we worked on. Same title. Clicked in my head, light bulb went on. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lang. Are there further questions or comments? <clears throat> Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. Um, to the testifiers, what's the biggest fish the veterans have caught up there? <laughs> to whomever <laughs> wants to brag about their fish. Mm -hmm. I, I would say a northern pike, Madam Chair, and uh, probably in that 38 to 40 inch class of fish, and it was actually caught by a female veteran on a retreat. <clears throat> Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Have you got it on display? Mm -hmm. I have, pass. Madam Chair, uh, I do have pictures uh, on display at the resort of uh, the veteran and uh, civilian guide holding the fish up and smiles from ear to ear. Uh, the fish was in the slot, so it was released, but we do have uh, photographic proof of said fish, yes. Sounds like a great place to, to relax and get to know other veterans. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Anderson. For the comment or question, Senator Housechild. Thank you, Chair Murphy, members of the committee. We are really lucky, and, and I, any chance I get to talk about northern Minnesota, I do, because it really is the gem of Minnesota. Um, the Boundary Waters, the Superior National Forest, Ely, the North Shore, all of these places are the best of Minnesota. And I really can't think of a better opportunity for this committee and for our legislature to allocate money in support of disabled veterans than to provide them the opportunities that exist right here in our state and uh, in northern Minnesota. Um, I've had the chance to visit Ely and, and talk with some of the members of this great organization about the importance of this funding and what it does, and you heard that testimony today. Um, so I just greatly thank everybody here. It sounds like there's a lot of support for this program, and uh, I just greatly thank you, and I thank the service uh, members that testified today. Thank you, Senator House Child. With that, uh, Senate file... Senator Gustafson moves that Senate file 351 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Thank you. All right, members, uh, having completed our agenda, the meeting for today is adjourned. Pardon me, Senator.